going to Atlanta to shoot school days, right? How did you even get linked up with Spike Lee? Once again, that was, uh, uh, so the same two ladies that, um, oh no, I take that back. It wasn't, it wasn't Tony, it wasn't Tony and Jackie. It was Robbie Reed. So Robbie Reed, who I'd met years earlier at a place called Inner City Cultural Center, which was like a black um, theater space in Los Angeles. Uh, a lot of people used to come through there, Ted Lang and, and Marla Gibbs, and they would do shows. Um, so I met Robbie there, and then somewhere along the line, Robbie became a casting director. So when Spike you know, was doing, getting ready to do school days, she called people in, you know, I did a, I think I did a reading for her or something. And she put us on tape and, um, and then you get, you know, you get a call. It's like, oh, um, you got a part. Spike wants to meet you. And so now everybody auditioned for the leads. I mean, when you, when you read, you were either, you know, if, if you were a guy, you were either reading for Giancarlo Esposito's role or you were, for Lawrence Fishburne's role. It was, you know, those were the two big roles. So I was, I was, I read for Giancarlo Esposito's role, uh, Big Brother Almighty. And, <laughs> and, you know, so then you go and you meet Spike and you realize, you know, that's not the role you got. I'm, you're Big Brother Chucky. But I met him at, um, I met him at uh, the Chateau Marmont. That's, he, he loves that place. He would be there a lot. And I went in. And it was the first time I met Spike, and he was just like, he was so enthusiastic. <laughs> He's like, ah, they don't know what they did, giving me five million dollars. I'm gonna mess them up. He didn't say it like that, and I, I don't want to, you know. He, but he's like, I'm, I'm gonna show these something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use. He, this he was money. big at the time, right? Like Spike Lee was at the like, he was very big at that time, right? He, well, this was his first big thing after. Um, She's got to have it. After she's got to have it. Man. It was his first big thing after she's got to have it. And, and he was just so, he was so hyped about it. He's like, they, they don't know what they did giving me this money. Because <laughs> he, 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 he's ready to set the world on fire. Um, which I think he eventually did when he got to, you know, uh, uh, some of his other films. How was that movie for you being next you? were you had that fraternity experience and what they were highlighting about the fraternity it was interesting because you know and and it, it's <laughs> i wouldn't say that this in terms of my particular frat but there was a lot of truth to what he was dealing with in terms of fraternities um in terms of uh, the hazing or the colorism, the hazing, probably the hazing, but a bit of the colorism. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can see it sometimes, and not as much anymore. But you know, there was there was a point where you would look at the AKAs, and it was hard to find a dark AKA. On the West Coast, also, I thought that'd be more like a East Coast down South thing. It was on the West Coast like that. You would you you would just kind of see it. I'm not saying that it was always, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know they they kind of had the the cues were always dark and like ready to throw down, and the alphas were these little guys like me, <laughs> you know. It was, but th that's a generalization. But so some of, I would say some of that was there for sure. Um, I would say the other thing that, that probably was there in terms of the frat side is kind of the, the attitude towards women. I mean, you know, you're in, you're in college, young guys anyhow all, all mostly have a, you know, a one-track mind and how they're dealing with, with ladies. You put a bunch of them together and it just spirals up. So some of the things that he played around with, or he well, played around is the wrong word, but that he uh, uh, kind of wrote within the script of School Days, I think were, were honest. Now, I would say that I feel like, and this is what movies do, um, he heightened it. He, 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 he took it to a level that isn't what was there, but you know, that's part of the filmmaking process. You know, you don't, 
you don't go to a movie to see your life. You go to a movie to see something extraordinary and how people are going to get out of bigger, more extraordinary situations, which is why, you know, you rarely see anybody in an action film shave in the morning or go to the bathroom. It's, it's like, we're not interested in that. We just want the big stuff, you know? Um, with school days, right? Uh, it inspires you to write a film, another class. Yeah, well, between Spike, Robert Townsend, and uh, some classes that I had at, at USC, because um, I, I wasn't a film major, major I was a, I, I had three degrees. I ended up with philosophy of religion, um, uh, public relations, and a theater degree. Yeah, those are my three degrees. Um, but one of the things I saw, uh, a class that I had there was a, a film, kind of a film uh, criticism class, and different, different directors would come in. So John Sayles, if you know who he is, came in. Uh, and John Sayles was a, you know, kind of an indie director. He did Brother from Another Planet, those kind of I know movies. That one, right. I know yeah, that one, right. yeah. But he had one called The Sakaka Seven that was about a group of friends that just got together over the weekend. And then, uh, so I saw that in school, and then later I saw uh, um, a movie called The Big Chill uh, that Lawrence Kasdan wrote and directed, which was also about a group of friends that, you know, haven't seen each other for a while, get together over a weekend. And so that, that became um, kind of a template for me for the other class, which was about a, a group of black friends that get together and haven't seen each other a while, over, over a weekend. And obviously, uh, Spike and Robert, and particularly Spike, I guess, at this point, because I remember in doing school days, there were people uh, among the crew that was like, I, you know, I don't like how Spike has the movie ending and just wake up or whatever. And Spike was like, look, if you don't, you don't like it, write your own damn film. This is my film. You write a film. And, you know, I, I was like, yeah, you know, he's right. It's easy to criticize what somebody has done. But to put yourself out there and create, that's a whole different thing, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I found, I found that to be kind of a, an inspiring, inspiring thing. Now, I didn't have any problem with how the movie ended. I, I, I liked the whole thing, but I did like Spike's directness and how he dealt with, with that you know, that question that came back to him is like, this is my movie. <laughs> you, know, like, you, you can write a movie, go do your thing. Um, go ahead. I, I was going to ask the, uh, I don't know how to say it, the Black Anthropy movie. Um, Black Anthropy? Yeah. Oh, was the, that around oh, the same the, time? That was too? a play that I wrote, Black Anthropy. Oh, that was a play. All right. Yeah. So that was uh, the disease of being black and wealthy. So, okay. Yeah. So, um, I wrote this play called The Black Horror Show, or uh, the subtitle was Blackanthropy. It was based on the concept of lycanthropy or lycanthropy, which is the disease of being a, a werewolf, a, a lycrothrope. That's a, that's a werewolf. Uh, so blackanthropy was the disease of being black. And it was a play where a, a, very, uh, a, a very assimilated black businessman goes to the hood for career day, which he doesn't want to do because he doesn't want to go to the hood. And he doesn't want to be around these tired mofos. So he, he go, but he goes. And while he's there, this Rastafarian dude comes up and like shakes his hand really hard. And he, he, he like goes back to his office and it's like days later. And he's like, he starts having these starts having these kind of fits where anytime he hears, um, I think, was it, a, it was a Miles Davis, I can't remember the track, it was a jazz track, he, he starts like kind of going outside of himself. It's like he wants to take off his tie. He, 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 he doesn't want to process his hair. He, you know, he's like, he, all of a sudden he's into really big butts and he was with the flat butts for a while. And he, he ultimately, this, this Rastafarian, when he shook his hand, is like, you know, he, he dug his fingernails in and, and there was an exchange of some blood. And now he is going through this process where 
he becomes a, a Black Panther. But like a, in, the, in the horror movie, you become a werewolf, he becomes a Black Panther, but a Black Panther. He's like, all of a sudden he wants a beret, he wants a leather jacket, you know, it's Huey Newton is <laughs> his dude, and it's all like that. So that was, that was uh, the Black Horror Show, and then that, that kind of informed some of what we ended up doing uh, with Tales from the Hood.